Okay. We all here? Probably not all of us, but the rate is decreasing. I see an anomaly in the arrival rate. So I'm going to talk tonight about two different SQL engines, Apache Drill and the part of Apache Spark called Spark SQL. And this sort of talk often comes down to a, Rah, my team's the greatest. I think we're going to see something very different from that tonight. So I'm Ted Dunning. I'm Chief Application Architect at MapR. I also am a committer and PMC member on a bunch of Apache projects. I can't count past two. I'm a binary guy, so uh, I don't remember how many. Uh, I'm also VP of Incubator right now, whose primary job is to keep people calm and keep things incubating. We have about 55, 56 projects incubating at Apache right now, so the, the number of new projects at Apache is still going to go up. For sure, for sure, for sure. You can get to me by email, by Twitter, by any kind of mechanism you like. You can catch me in the hallways, uh, and I'd love to talk. Whatever you want to do, I'm happy to help make it happen. So first, I'm going to start talking uh, about what is drill, what drill is, how it works. I'm going to go into a fair bit of detail on that. Uh, and. Then I'm going to contrast that and show the contrasting aspects of how Spark SQL works. So Drill is a query engine that has columnar and vectorized data. It's optimistically pipelined. It does runtime compilation and late binding. It's also very extensible very easily. So for instance, you can do a query on a single file like this. You can see there, hmm, no laser. Uh, how can I talk without a laser? So uh, these are rear projections, so it isn't going to matter, I bet. But the, uh, the first part there where you say select looks just like SQL, but then the part where it says from, you can see a path name in there. So drill thinks of files as tables. It doesn't need ETL to talk to things. And in fact, one of the common uses is to just put in an entire directory path. And everything at multiple levels below that will be considered part of that table. Automatically, you get partitioning. And one of the key advantages here is you avoid centralization and single point of failure on your metadata service. The data itself is self-describing, and so you can just work with it. You don't have to ask anybody what it's shaped like or what format it's in. So that's one of the things that Drill does. And in particular, Drill works in a completely distributed way. There are multiple processes called drill bits. See, that's a pun. Uh, this is in homage to uh, Apache Pig, which is the project with the most density of puns ever. So drill's trying to catch up here with drill bits. And drill maintains a distributed cache. When you send a query in, it can go to any drill bit. And the drill bits then uh, cooperate. But, but first, there's an execution plan that's done by that first drill bit, that first drill bit is called the foreman. And then it communicates with the other drills bits so that they can understand what query needs to be done, which part of it they do. All the results ultimately are collected back on the foreman or into results in a distributed way. And then that goes back to the origin of the query. The query is planned in multiple stages. Now, one of the big reasons for doing it in multiple stages is so that you can inject plans that you may have recorded or generated from different languages in at different points in the planning. But another aspect of this is Drill wants to do a very comprehensive job of planning. And by doing it in stages, it can do optimization early, even before it has information entirely about the data. So the SQL query goes through a parser to produce a parse tree. There's a logical planner that makes no reference to any type information that's not obvious from the name of the data or any metadata files that are available. Uh, it also is done without any reference to the shape or size of your cluster. The logical plan then, after optimization, is sent to a physical planner where we know much, much more about the data types and the structure of the data. And at this point, pieces of execution the actual execution plan is sent in little bitty bits to the query foreman and out to the entire drill cluster. 
there's uh, cost-based optimization at every level, and the little fragments that go out then form a graph of computation, and the data streams through that graph in order to get results. So the, the, the path of the data, of the, the query through from parser, through optimizer, scheduler, foreman, and so on to the drill bits, and then ultimately to the, the data shown here. And there's some interesting characteristics there. The storage appliance, or the, the scanners over here, have the property that they can inject optimization rules into drill. So if you have a storage device or storage system or a database that has unusual properties, then you can inject special optimizations for those interesting properties back into the optimization process. And that's a very unusual property of drill there. The distributed cache helps keep all of the pieces in good synchronization without any, uh, without much worry about detailed consensus. Now, the data that's going through the, the DAG, the computation graph in drill, is sent as small batches of data, so about 100,000 rows at a time. And by sending these values, we also get a schema known as the empirical schema with each batch. That means we don't necessarily know the schema for the entire data set as we're processing data. So what drill does is it generates code as it's executing. And as long as the empirical schema for successive batches in a single operation stay unchanged, it can reuse that generated code. Then if the, if the types generalize or if a type becomes nullable or appears for the first time, it can regenerate that code if necessary. So drill also maintains a four value instead of a three value semantics so that it can deal with unknown properties. The, the size of the batch is limited and the, the batches are shipped in a particular way, a columnar representation that's very similar to what's used in Dremel. But the key property the, of these data as they ship around is that they can land from the network interface and they don't require any deserialization or any serialization when you send it back out onto the, uh, the uh, network interface to go to the next component. This is a big deal because simply copying the data more than once, meaning it lands and then you send it away, if you have to copy it in between those two steps, you will lose a major fraction of performance. And the RPC mechanism in Drill is designed for multiple replies to a request so that you can request data and you can get many batches back from it. You can store fixed width sorts of things like integers or bytes that's stored in a byte buffer, or you can store vectors of things. Now, one of the interesting things about this is that even data that appears somewhat polymorphic is ultimately translated in the value vectors into uniform typed vectors, arrays in memory. That means that if you have uniformly typed data, the JVM and the code generation will notice that, and they will generate very efficient uh, code for this. And in particular, the JVM can actually inject uh, vectorized instructions that work on multiple data elements at the same time. This is unusual to do in a, di a dynamically typed sort of situation. Most dynamically typed data sort of systems go a row at a time and have very loose typing. And so they have a lot of dispatching, a lot of ifs statements in the core loop. Drill, on the other hand, knows the data types, and so it can force that into very, very tight code. No branches. And this uh, runtime compilation can result in enormous increases in speed. Now, this has become fairly standard lately uh, among systems. Impala does dynamic code generation, and Spark SQL does it. But this was one of the interesting innovations in Drill. Now, the, the drill compiler generates code 
from prototypes. So it actually, when you write a UDF, it lifts your source code out of your definition, injects it into the generated code. This allows the code to be executed with no object creation. So there is never an object for a row that's generated. And for any primitive types, they're never boxed and put into anything but primitive values. Then the generated code from that source code transformation is engineered with bytecode templates to produce the actual execution. Um, drill is optimistic. It doesn't worry about checkpointing because most drill queries are relatively fast. And that's fast relative to the mean time to interrupt. So typical cluster sizes are 1,000 nodes or less. Those typically have less than 50,000 cores. And an average operational time there is something like 500,000 core hours. And so most queries are going to run much less than that. And so the probability of getting a check is low. And therefore, the value of checkpointing aggressively in the computation is very, very low. The longest drill queries typically run at around tens of hours. So that's a very modest number of CPU core hours. The uh, recovery, therefore, is very simple. All we have to do is resubmit the query. You can also do pipelining if you're very aggressive like that, because data that's passed doesn't need to be recreated. The pipelining allows uh, execution to proceed in parallel and in different stages in different parts of the, uh, the cluster. That also gives us a very, very simple memory band or a memory life cycle. As fragments move around the cluster, after I've given you all the fragments that I can see, I can give up that memory. And furthermore, since fragments are size bounded, I know exactly how big that memory can be. This allows drill to avoid almost all garbage collection, even though it's written in Java. It can handle very large amounts of data. I've seen queries that handle uh, hundreds of billions of rows in large joins. And that works in a fixed and finite amount of memory. This is a, a big deal when you're worried about operational stability and multi-tenancy. And that execution off heap with no GC is a an unusual characteristic for any Java program. But it also allows Drill to expand memory as necessary, but then decrease its memory footprint on demand and command. So that's an extraordinary property for a JVM thing. The, uh, the old name for the optimizer was Optique. Drill brought that into Apache. That's been since spun out as a system called Calcite. And as I mentioned earlier, it has a pluggable cost model and pluggable optimizations. OK, so that's a very quick introduction to Drill. Now, I've left out a few things that are very, very different from Spark, but we'll get to those in a bit. So Spark SQL is essentially syntactic sugar over a subset of what Spark can do. You're allowed to express programs as SQL programs underneath the covers Spark generates a DAG very, very much like a normal Spark program. And therefore, it inherits all of the virtues of resilient data and things like that, but also all of the vices, such as a very complex memory lifecycle that Spark itself has. One of the particularly cool things that you can do is you can register at runtime arbitrary lambdas as UDFs. Now, there's a performance hit there, a very substantial one relative to the full dynamic computation. But the, f the flexibility is pretty cool. Now, inputs ultimately have to be loaded and then stored into RDDs. There can be a substantial uh, serialization cost there. They also have to be serialized and deserialized when moved from processor to processor. Now, Spark SQL was not designed as a streaming engine. It was designed to have all of that data in memory. And that leads to a particular execution path. But it also leads to certain performance advantages. And in particular, it leads to the ability to embed Spark SQL fully as a first class citizen inside Spark. So you can write code of one kind, Sparky code, 
then you can write a little bit of Spark SQL code, and then you can go back to writing in Scala or Java or Python. And that's a big deal. There really is a big deal, because there's an awful lot of things that you'd like to do in this world that you really can't do in SQL. I mean, especially, I mean, I was originally an electrical engineer and liked to do signal processing. Those are some of the things that Spark does well and SQL does poorly. But then there's a lot of things like data prep that Spark does well and are pain in the ass in a, an imperative language. So that mixing is a big key point there. Now, Spark program consists of a computation graph that produces these resilient data sets. Spark SQL allows these to be done using SQL, but then the optimizer works over that entire graph up to the time that you try to ask for concrete data. And so they interoperate very, very seamlessly. You, you have the same steps as you would have in drill. You have input, typically in SQL, if we're talking about Spark SQL, but Java, Python, or whatever. That goes in, into a logical plan. That is the data structure that you create when you write your program. When you say dot map or dot filter in a normal Scala program for Spark, you are building a data structure not running code. That produces a logical plan. What the SQL parser does is just generates that from a textual representation rather than a fluid API. The optimizer in Spark runs in ways that are similar, but generally not as extensive as in Drill. And in particular, the optimizer is much more static in Spark than it is in Drill. And so what you then get is a combined DAG which goes from RDDs, that's what these brownish, reddish things are, through operators, back to RDDs, and so on, through the computation, wherever operators are not fused, as Spark tries to do at every opportunity. So there are some very, very important differences that we can see at this point. Spark's execution assumes RDDs are the complete representation of the data all of it, the entire table, as it were, in an RDD. Now, the RDD need not necessarily be in memory. It might not be in memory because it could be recomputed cheaply. It might not be in memory because it might have been spilled to disk. But in general, Spark does very, very poorly when either of those happens. You generally want that to be there. So it loses that streaming semantics, loses that memory uh, lifecycle model. Its input sources don't gen inject special properties. So for instance, the previous talk was talking about running queries in solar and things like that. Solar has very odd characteristics from the standpoint of SQL, but they're very useful characteristics. And so it'd be nice to be able to optimize queries for that strange behavior. Mongo has very strange semantics as well that are very different from solar. And then if you're driving query portions into JDBC, you'd like to be able to query, optimize those and drive actual chunks of queries. So you can't do that, really. There's no mechanism that's very strong for that in Spark. And most RDDs are not zero copy serialization. And then it, Spark uses the off heap capabilities very little and does not have strict control over allocation. That said, you could do very, very nice, simple things. Here's a classic query that would normally be used as a demo for drill. See, there's a file name. Now, drill would have put a workspace here instead of a format. The workspace, or the, the, where the file is, what technology is storing the file or table is assumed by other mechanisms in Spark. And here we have nested data, missing data, empty list. Drill handles those sorts of things well, but Spark does now as well. Spark SQL has gained that capability in the last two versions. Uh, another query that might be interesting is you can take that list from the previous statement and you can explode it. Now, only one record had a non-empty, non-null result, so we only wind up with records from the three row. But we can deal with and explode nested data. We can do a lot of the things that Drill was famous for because it pioneered that in Spark SQL pretty easily. 
So here's the first synthesis. Now, you're going to have to watch these next two slides for some important differences. Drill has a better optimizer, better code generation. This often leads to a 2x uh, speed advantage in various scenarios. It has value vectors and row batches. This leads to much less memory pressure. Drill has a much stricter memory life cycle, which can improve multi-tenancy, allows Drill to serve many users at the same time. And Drill is all about SQL execution, very efficient. Now, I can turn this slide upside down and inside out, and I can say Spark can optimize across the entire program. Remember I said Drill had a better optimizer. Well, in the micro case, it is. It's a much better optimizer, but Spark has a greater scope of optimization. So that can lead to 2x speed advantage, just like the other. The Drill speed optimizer can lead to a 2x advantage. Really depends on the situation. Spark has much more flexible memory structures. You have control. You can write your own structures. You can build your own way of dealing with things. And in fact, one of the things coming into Spark is direct interoperability with Drill's memory structures, with value vectors via Apache Arrow. Now, the flexibility of these things can let us build very highly compressed data structures, which can lead to less memory pressure. It's the same advantage Drill had but for a different reason. Spark has a much more flexible RDD lifecycle, so the RDDs can persist in memory between multiple queries, which is something Drill doesn't do. Drill depends on caching below its purview to get some of those effects, but you can't control it. And Spark is not all about SQL execution. I mean, the advantage of Drill was that it is a specialist. The advantage of Spark is that it isn't. So there's some interesting differences there, but there's all kinds of, your mileage will vary. Now, there are some big, big, big differences. And this is what I alluded to earlier. Drill focuses very heavily on secure multi-tenant data access. So it has strong impersonation semantics. You're allowed to do cascading writes via views. If I have rights to a table to read it, I can build a view that he has rights to query. And he can build a view on top of my view using his permissions to my view to see limited parts of the data. And he can let her see some aspect of his view. This is very, very useful for masking and things like that, where I want to mask and give him a limited view. And then his responsibility is to give other people even more limited views. Now, because of the strong semantics for impersonation, the people down the chain can't penetrate back up those views, can't rewrite those queries, because they don't own those views. And they don't have the rights to do what that view does. This is an unusual security model in any Unix heritage sort of system, but it is a common rights system. This idea that you can delegate rights is a very common thing in data warehouses. Drill, as far as I know, is the only Hadoop execution model that allows this sort of thing. Now, queries also coexist in a cluster more easily because of that very strict memory residency control. So if I have a query that's flowing through here and most of its execution has passed on, that memory will be freed up, even though my query hasn't finished. And so somebody else's query can go into that open space. That's absolutely not typical in Spark. Now, Spark, on the other hand, focuses very, very heavily on fully integrated execution models that are multilingual, multiple kinds of functions in different languages, and things like that, and focuses very much on the advantages of being in memory. These are big differences between the two systems, and they lead them to be useful in different situations. This is a picture for people who are looking later at the slides so they can understand a bit more about how these drill security, how these delegating views work, and how we can have an end user who has rights to data that they would not otherwise have rights to. And that lets us be very granular about exactly what version and which rows and which columns somebody has a right to see. Uh, so this then leads us to, the, to the, the real question. Did we even ask the right question at the beginning? When we said drill versus 
you know, it's like this Godzilla versus Mechagodzilla sort of big battle. Uh, neither one of these is Mothra. And that really wasn't the right question. A much more interesting question is how could we unify the benefits of these systems? How could we get the benefits of drill in a spark sort of environment? It turns out that it's really pretty easy to do, which is probably credit as much as anything to Spark's flexibility. We can build a, a, a drill context, which is exactly like a SQL context. We can define data sets in Spark as drill data sources and sinks. And then it just works. Now we need to orchestrate data to and from Spark, Spark to drill and drill back to Spark. But the cost of that transport is remarkably small. And the benefits of the natively very fast execution in drill often outweigh that extra step of copying. Because there's only one step in and out. So you can wind up with programs that have Spark natively and then drill and then Spark and Spark. And these RDDs along the way can use any tool that's handy. That means that you can use the standard sorts of drill capabilities like integration with Tableau or other BI tools for very powerful operations that might not be suitable for Spark SQL. Is it valuable? I mean, there is Spark SQL. Why do we need another one? Well, I think it is. I think it is because there are some very, very different operational characteristics of these systems. I don't think there are production uses of, of uh, Spark that do, Spark SQL especially, that do joins on trillions of rows of data. And yet Drill can handle that. These data sets are much larger than would ever fit in an RDD efficiently and need a streaming style of execution. Those sorts of situations are where Drill really begins to outweigh Spark SQL. So here's an example. We're going to talk about a simulation here where we have a universe which is simulating a whole bunch of users who are talking to cell towers. And we then get a stream out the other side. And we want to do queries against that. The, the users go through a, a moderately complex uh, life cycle. They make calls. They touch, talk to towers. They talk to other towers. They listen for signal strengths. And they report what they see to whichever tower they're talking to. Lots and lots of log events are buffered and then sent to whichever tower can get them. And the resulting data, in particular the signal strength data, is very, very interesting. Because if we just rearrange the data as it's received, we can put all of the reports for a single tower in one place, and we can begin to see what's the signal strength around that tower. We can see where the people are who actually are using the tower. And we can do some, some interesting things. Now, when I say location here, for simplicity, I'm going to say x and y. But in fact, that's not quite true. You need some fancy processing to make that work. So for the simple sort of reporting and dashboarding, we could use any kind of SQL we'd like. For very large joins, we would perhaps need to use a more drillish sort instead of a Spark SQL sort. But then what we can do is we can combine these into composite systems that really begin to use the power of all the alternative tools. So these events are coming into towers at irregular intervals. It's tricky to see anomalies in that, in particular when something stops. When, when things stop, when data stops, it's often harder to detect than when things start or when some value changes. And so what we want to do is detect that. The easy way to do that is to look in the change interval. We can set bounds on that. We can do anomaly detection. We can even estimate. Notice how the, these are time intervals between events. But notice how it goes up and down. The rate goes up. Come on. There it is. Up at some times and stays down at other times. But we can normalize that away. If we can model this rate effectively, then we can normalize that data back to something. This is the same data, but renormalized by rate. So these are kind of machine learning things that we would be wanting to do. These are some of the things that I mentioned SQL doesn't like. It doesn't like doing machine learning. It doesn't like 
doing these sort of percentile things on the fly. So we can build data chains like this, which are very non-sequely, but then where do these events come from? What we can do there is look for cases like that. We can front it with SQL, and now we can ask questions like, is something shadowing part of the propagation from this? Imagine we have a single tower. Intensity is yellow and white. But as we go away from the tower, it gets weaker. And if we obscure part of the propagation there by some shadowing event, like a crane or construction event, how can we detect that? You can't just estimate the magnitude there and do subtraction. You need to do something fancier, partly because subtraction of these amounts is a very complicated phenomenon with RF. When signals are weak, you see other interferences a lot. When signals are strong, the differences are smaller. So finding the anomalies in this coverage is tricky. Let's move along, and we can see how to do that. Move, there we go. So we're going to cluster the signal strength reports. We're going to cluster the locations using a large number of clusters. And then we're going to model that using that. So here, difficult to spot, are the coverages of different towers in a simulation. Sadly, the colors didn't make it through here. We're going to look at just that upper cluster. And we're going to cluster within one tower's coverage area. Somebody's pointing to the other screen. We're going to cluster one tower's coverage into a couple of geometric regions using k-means clustering. And then within that, we're going to label these. So the first step is to group by tower and then do a location model. So we get real x, y locations. The first thing is best done using SQL. The second thing is best done using Java. Now, the first one is best done using SQL with very, very flexible input properties, like drill. Second step is best done with numerical models, like Java or even C. Next, we want to split the data. That's a pretty simple thing. Maybe we do Spark SQL there. We want to cluster it, move the cluster model down here, and mark it. And now we want to be doing SQL again to mark things as to which cluster they belong to. But then we want to be doing discrete time modeling to determine when things stop happening. So the summary here is that we can build realistic data chains that use both tools, use Spark, Spark SQL, and Spark, and Drill together in points that they work well together for the virtues of each one. Very, very large scale, high performance streaming sort of uh, execution for drill. Very, very flexible, imperative style programming from Spark. And they can be brought together, and we can make the integration first class. There's also ways that these programs can work together, and indeed are. So for instance, Apache Arrow, an offshoot of drill originally, now has 12 more major projects, including Spark, contributing and hopefully becoming much more interoperable in the future because of that. So the anomaly detection stuff, which I covered way too fast to be expected to understand, is covered largely in this book that Ellen and I wrote. Uh, we have copies of these other books and that one uh, available for free download from the MAPR website. Uh, and you can get us uh, tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock we'll be signing copies of our latest streaming data book. And I think we have five minutes less for questions. Anybody got any questions about Drill and Spark and Spark SQL? Yeah. Question. We were doing some, um, I guess, in the past, we had Spark SQL and some So the question was RDDs versus data frames for Spark SQL performance. Data frames largely give you information about the data, and they give you somewhat a columnar representation. Uh, they give you some performance improvements, I think largely due to better optimization. They're not going to give you the same performance as streaming the data through, because you're going to have just enormously less 
memory pressure. And so I don't think that the, that the performance advantage of drill is going to go away due to data frames or data sets. But that's, you know, I'm clearly on the wrong side of the fence to make that judgment in any authoritative way. And, and we've been surprised in the past by how much benefit you get, even though you're crossing that barrier to drill with this data. Did, did I see somebody wiggling? It's going to be like an auction, you know, a question auction. If you wiggle too much, I'm going to make you ask a question. Any more? So I think, oh, yeah, sure. What's next for drill? So the question is, what's next for drill? Well, there's a lot of things coming for drill having to do with better optimization, better code generation, a lot of different input sources uh, from a bunch of different things. There's also improvements in the actual semantic model coming up and improving the experience that way, especially on very, very polymorphic data. Once you start looking at complex data, it isn't like you have a fixed schema. Once people have flexibility, they screw you up. They put 12, 13, 15, a list with five numbers in it. So you just change from numbers to lists. And so that polymorphism drill already handles a lot of it, but there are limits to how much polymorphism it handles, and that'll be made much, much better in the future. I think there'll be a lot of uh, querying against streams, not necessarily in a streaming sense, not necessarily uh, taking the streams as streams, but taking, I want to do a query from three months ago to now against this data that's sitting in a stream. So that's another data source, an odd data source, but a very cool one. Yeah. So um, you're heavily involved in a lot of these Apache projects, right? So you did a great job today of seeing how two different technologies could actually use the, the strengths of each one um, and merge them together. Do you see more of that happening? Because there's just so many new tools coming out, and a lot of times you feel like you have to choose one over the other. Um, this was good of showing how two can work together. So the the question started with some nice words about making things look together, work together. So, and will that happen more? I think it can happen more. I think that a lot of people historically at a, who've come to Apache with projects have viewed it as, unfortunately, a way for them to just kind of misuse the Apache brand and just own a project. The temptation for a company to do that is high if they have something on their price list that matches uh, a, an Apache project name. And we've, we've found that very strongly in Drill that our competitors are very loath to support it uh, purely because we offer it as a product. And so, you know, we have a bit of a different point of view there. We, you know, if we build technology that nobody else can build, we make it a product. If we want to share technology, we share it openly and view it as a bug if we're the only committers. Uh, and so one of the best strategies for drill then t is to bud technology out into non-product named projects. So Apache Arrow will never have a product name from somebody sells because it's too abstract for decision makers to buy. And as such, that's, that's kind of an advantage as well. That means people can share without these sad political games. And we see a lot of strength there uh, CalSite is shared across many, many projects. Nobody has an Apache CalSite project. We have Hive, we have Drill, we have Phoenix, all using CalSite. I think that's a big win. And so I think this little end run around project naming, product naming, may be one of the best ways to share in the real spirit of open source. But it's tricky, tricky, tricky to make that really work. Uh, there's a movie the full Monty, they had a great line, folk are not but queer. And it's just, once you think you understand them, it, nah, you don't. Yeah, I think we're down no, nearly to the last question. Well, yeah. <laughs> we could create a drill context is the, is the basic question. And there's, there's a sad story there. This was, work was done over a year ago, but then the guy didn't release it because it didn't feel like done enough. And this is a call to action to everybody. Uh, 
the point of open source is sharing things that are half done so you can have somebody help you. And I'm a little embarrassed that this hasn't been released. And I have this exact same discussion, like, <laughs> so if there's anybody here who'd like to see that, hang, hang your hand up right now. I'll use that as a lever to slam somebody in the head and say, yes, it's OK. Well, let's release it. It's, it's two versions of Spark ago. That's the big hang up right now is, oh, it's not current. Well, let's, let's release it in partial form on GitHub, and let's make it current and get it in Drill. I think that's the right philosophy. So if you want to raise your hand, I can, I can use that for pressure to make that so. Yeah, there we go. Let's do that. Two hands, even. Excellent. Well, that's a great way to finish on, on good lesson for sharing and how the shoemaker's co uh, sons have no shoes. <laughs> Thank you very much.